Richard Wagner is a louse. <laughs> and so I normally do not like to spend a lot of time talking about his biography. Uh, his music is today uh, associated with the Third Reich. He had a lot of similar political viewpoints to Adolf Hitler, and Hitler used Wagner's music um, as music in his reign for a while. So uh, what I want to concentrate on is Wagner's impact for the field of music. Wagner did want to be uh, a politician, but his political views during his own lifetime uh, were not synonymous with a lot of the other people. And so eventually he decided that music was, he was going to be better suited for that. Wagner believed that opera from the past was not cor correctly produced. In the past, opera houses were designed as upside down horseshoes where um, the stage and the orchestra, they had light and people would come to the opera and maybe they were interested in hearing the opera or maybe they were just going there to conduct business. You weren't a captive audience, in other words. And Wagner did not really like that. So before he started to write a lot of music, Wagner decided to write a treatise that would explain to the world how opera of the future should be seen. The treatise is called Gesamtkunstwerk, which is loosely translated as the total work of art. In this treatise, Wagner says you have theater, acting, you have the uh, text, and you have music. You have these three areas of fine art, and they need to be blended equally, but then choose one to be consistent. And so Wagner's thought was the conductor would come out, drop his baton, and start the orchestra, and then the orchestra would not cease to play until the end of the act. So there's not a number opera concept any longer. There's not spoken dialogue by itself. Every aria, every chorus just emerges out of this orchestral fabric. Spoken dialogue is going to have music behind it. So he wanted to blend them all as equally as possible in his concept. And then he also said, this upside down horseshoe concept, no. We need an amphitheater where the orchestra is sunken and you cannot see them at all. You have all of the people on steps on a riser idea. And we have several classrooms at uh, Georgia Highlands that exemplify this. When you go to the movies today, you have a lot of movie auditoriums that are designed in that manner. And so Wagner wanted you to be a captive audience. He wanted the lights to go out in the hall and it'd be so dark that you couldn't see the, your own hand in front of your face. And then when the lights would come on on the stage, then you were going to be having an interactive response to the music and to the acting and to the opera itself. So Wagner's music dramas, he didn't even like to call them operas, he called them music dramas, is the wave of the future, he said in the treatise. So Wagner then sets out on this journey to write this own, his own libretto, his own text, and then set it to music. And it took him uh, over 20 years to develop the Ring of the Nibelung, which is his masterwork that showcases his concept in the total work of art. The Ring of the Nibelung takes between, depending upon tempos, 16 to 18 hours to perform. It's divided up into four different segments, so you wouldn't hear all of it in the same evening, but it starts off with the story called Das Rheingold as the prologue, and then it has the trilogy, Die Valkyrie or the Valkyries, Siegfried, and Die Gata Damerung or the Twilight of the Gods. I'm going to quickly give you a, a brief summary of these operas. In Das Rheingold, there is a mountain that's encrusted with Rheingold, and a dwarf is able to get some of it. Well, Wagner uh, talks about in his Norse mythology storyline that Wotan, the king of the gods, had placed three Rhine maidens in the lake around the mountain to protect it so that nobody would get their hands on the Rheingold. But this dwarf named Alberic does. If anybody's able to command control of the gold, then suddenly 
they're going to have more power than all the gods together. So Alberic then takes the gold to his brother, Mema, who's a forger. And Mema forges the gold into a ring and into a helmet. The helmet and the ring have tremendous power. So when Votan, the king of the gods, finds out about this, he knows that he's going to have to try and go down and rescue the gold. So he and one of the other gods, Loga, the fire god, go down and they end up tricking Alberic and they get the gold back. What's been going on in the meantime is that Votan has contracted two giants, Fossilt and Fafner, into building Valhalla, the kingdom of the gods. So they are now ready to be paid. So they don't know, uh, Votan does not know if he's going to be able to pay them or not. So finally he gets them to acknowledge what they want and that what they want is one of the gods. So Votan finally convinces them that they will build a tower of riches that is as tall and as wide as that particular god. Well, all the gods contribute their wealth and they build this little tower and unfortunately it's not quite enough. But if you add the ring and the helmet to the tower, then it is. So the giants are now pleased and they start to take their wealth with them and uh, one, uh, the, the two giants can't uh, decide who gets the ring and who gets the helmet and so one kills the other, puts the helmet on, morphs himself into a fire-breathing dragon and drags all those riches out uh, to some hidden place. And that's the beginning of the Ring of the, of the Nibelung. Then we go to the next installment, which is the Valkyrie. The Valkyries are the warrior maidens that ride the winged horses that uh, protect Valhalla. And all of these Valkyries are daughters of Wotan. The lead Valkyrie, Brunhilde, is Wotan's favorite. So Wotan in the beginning of this story says, uh, Brunhilde, I want to tell you a little story. Once upon a time, I decided to become a mortal man. And when I was mortal, I fell in love with this lady and had this love affair. She gave birth to twins. Unfortunately, she died uh, when she was giving birth. So I became bored at that time of being a mortal man, and I decided I wanted to become, go back to my God state. But before I did, I tried to find someone to take the twins. He couldn't find one family to take them both, so they were separated at birth. The twins, they, one was a boy and one was a girl. And now the story goes 18 years ahead. The two meet. Well, Zeglinda, the girl, is already married to another guy called Hunding, and he's a champion hunter. And there's a law of the land. If you are a hunter and you are out late, then anybody must offer you uh, their abode, a room within their house, in exchange for some of the game that you've killed that day. So uh, Zeglinda has a, here's a knock at the door. Her husband is off hunting, but the knock at the door is Zygmunt, and Zygmunt is also a hunter. And so because of the law of the land, she lets him in, and uh, he offers her some of the game, and she cooks it up, and they talk, and they start to uh, get the hots for each other, and then they have a one-night stand, and then they come to in the morning, and then they start to figure out, oh, don't we look a lot alike? Oh, don't we have a lot of the same similar situations? And it's too late that incestual one-night stand leaves the Glenda pregnant. Well, the husband comes back in and kills Zygmunt and now is about to kill Zyglinda and Brunhilde sweeps in, rescues the girl. She then uh, gives birth for, uh, is, goes through her pregnancy and, and like her mother before has a bad pregnancy and she passes away, but the child does survive. And so then Brunhilde sweeps in and takes the child and tries to find somebody who would raise it. Wotan had warned Brunhilde to watch all this from afar and to not get involved. So she disobeyed her father. The reason that Wotan did not want Brunhilde involved at all is that he was in search of a free hero. A free hero is someone who is not a god, who has never been assisted by a god, 
because that is the only type of person who would be able to rescue the gold and return it to them so that they don't have to fear whoever is going to have that gold in their possession. Well, since Brunhilde did interfere, Wotan then puts Brunhilde into a deep sleep, lays her on a rock slab, and has the fire god Loga come and burn around her. If any of this is familiar to you, then you probably grew up like me watching cartoons and you're familiar with Elmer Fudd and the Bugs Bunny cartoon where they shout out, Kill the Wabbit. Well, that tune that they use is the Ride of the Valkyries tune that you hear in uh, the, uh, De Valkyrie, that second installment of The Ring of the Nibelung, which is on your listening exam. So let me continue on a little bit with the story. So now we get to the uh, third installment, which is Siegfried. Siegfried is that child that was born to the twins. He is now being raised by Mema, Alberic's brother, who originally stole the gold in the first place. Mema, though, is also a dwarf, and he's raising Siegfried to know no fear and become a champion hunter himself because he wants Siegfried to go off, slay that dragon, and get the uh, helmet and the ring back. Well, all the while, while he was growing up, Siegfried had a companion, and this companion was a, a wood bird. The wood bird always was singing to Siegfried, and Siegfried wondered what that wood bird was saying. He really wished he could understand. Well, the day comes. He's now turned 18 years old, and Mema thinks that this is the time that he can take uh, Siegfried and point him into the direction of the dragon's lair. Maybe he'll slay the dragon and bring the objects back. And when he brings the objects back, Mema just wants all that for himself. So he's conjuring up a little poison concoction to give to his adopted son. Well, Siegfried is successful. He goes off and slays the dragon. And he gets a little of the dragon's blood in his mouth. And after he does that, suddenly he's able to interpret the song of the woodbird. And the woodbird is truly Siegfried's friend. And the woodbird tells him everything that's going on about where he came from and about the fact that Mema is only out for the gold and he's going to try and kill him. So Siegfried goes back home, confronts him, and kills his adopted parrot. And then the woodbird takes Siegfried off on a journey to go and find Brunhilde, and he says, there's somebody out there who can fill you in. Well, Wotan wants to know just how strong and how powerful Siegfried is. So he meets Siegfried right before Siegfried is going to burst through the fl flames to find Brunhilde, and Siegfried does defeat Wotan, makes his way through the fl flames, and then experiences fear for the first time when he sees the beautiful Brunhilde. He kisses her, which wakes her up, and then they have a love affair together. And that's the beginning story of the fourth installment, The Twilight of the Gods. So get that straight in your head. The daughter of Brunhilde, uh, the daughter of Wotan, Brunhilde, is now hooking up with uh, Wotan's incestual grandchild. So it's kind of uh, aunt and uncle now. <laughs> So this story is incredibly warped, and then it goes on from there. What I would like for you to do is uh, read a synopsis of uh, The Ring of the Nibelun. And again, that's a, a horrible summary, but it does give you a little bit of an insight into what's going on. Wagner finishes The Ring of the Nibelung, and then he is searching for the proper opera house. Well, the people of Bayreuth, Germany, believe in Wagner's music so much that they build him his festival house. And so the premiere dates of the Ring of the Nibelung happen in 1876, in August of that year. Today, uh, Wagner's descendants still run the Bayreuth Festival. Every summer, um, people flock to Bayreuth to hear Wagner's music because it is so uh, extravagant and, and wild and crazy and big. You have to have dramatic voices to sing all the different characters of um, Wagner's music. But one thing that I want to mention is the light motif. 
When we were talking about Hector Berlioz and the Symphony Fantastique, I mentioned to you that the beloved was the recurring idea, the consistent thought in uh, the lovesick artist's mind for the five different movements of that Symphony Fantastique. And so you hear a musical phrase that represents her. Wagner calls this concept the light motive or the light motif, where you have um, a musical figure that represents Brunhilde, one that represents Siegfried, one that represents Wotan. You have the leitmotif for the ring, for the helmet, for love, for revenge. Because you have 16 plus hours of music, you have to have these little musical reminders, these musical motives to help you out along the way so that you can remember what character they're referencing or object or storyline or what have you. Now again, this is something that is very prevalent in television and movies today. Max Steiner, the organizer of King Kong, talks about how Gesamtkunstwerk or the total work of art and Wagner's concepts helped spur on some of the early ideas of American cinema. So Wagner's influence is still being felt today. One of the contemporary composers around uh, one of the greatest movie soundtrack composers is John Williams. And John Williams uses the leitmotif concept. If you are big fans of Raiders of the Lost Ark or the Indiana Jones um, movies, then you know that Indy has his own dum pa dum pum pum pa dum pum pa dum pum pum pa dum. And so all of that is echoing the traditions that Wagner has established for us back in the Romantic period. This concludes all of the information that you need for the fourth test over the Romantic period. And this also concludes the information for the class. I hope that you have really enjoyed uh, listening to these lectures and learning about this music. It is my desire that, uh, of course, you're probably not gonna love everything that I've talked about, but I hope that you find a particular style or a particular composer that you really do like and will listen to for the rest of your life. Have a great time. Thank you.